Good afternoon folks, hope you're sitting comfortably, hope you've got your coffee there ready. The idea behind this, we're going to have it relatively informal. Um, we'll start off with a sort of introduction, then go on to a few, to a discussion between us a little bit, and at the end we'll end up with some questions from, from you, um, and we'll see how Jacqueline's energy goes um, as this goes along. Start off by just intro introducing Jacqueline here, who is one of the wisest ladies that I know. Um, we're both from, <laughs> you can see it, she radiates knowledge. <laughs> We're both from the Brighton area, which makes us even closer than other people. Oh, yes. <laughs> and Jacqueline begins her career, um, in, grows up in Worthing in the south of England, and then gets lured away to university to go and learn English. And from then, English at that time was being taught in universities with Icelandic. Icelandic was part of, was part of the study. And then she gets drawn into Icelandic, and before she knows what's happening, she's translating... Gulmundasaga Dira, 
um, from, from Icelandic into English. And that leads her into all sorts of other new territories. Um, first of all, it starts off Icelandic interests mm -hmm. and the, the idea of, of um, oral tradition living behind stories, Icelandic sagas, and she's trying to find out well, how that works. And that leads in gradually to a series of translations um, which make her a definite Eastlandsvinner even before she even <laughs> comes to the country, along with, of course, Bruce Springsteen and, and a whole lot of other people. <laughs> Icelandic folktales and legends is still the best um, collection of Icelandic folktales and translation that can be found anywhere. And I am remind the bookshop here they should be buying this one rather than anything else. It's, it's got, um, it's, it's putting all of the Icelandic legends in, in, into context internationally. Sorry. And she went on from there to, like the return of, um, legends of Icelandic magicians, followed up on that, then there were, Ic there were Scandinavian legends. And this is bringing her, bringing her into folklore and into study of her own country, and we've got the folklore of Sussex, for example, here, British dragons, and you can see the direction that things are heading in at this point. Um, for those of you who are interested in her, in her scholarly work, which is incredibly wide-ranging, there's uh, a, a, an order form running around the room here for a collection of her essays, which were given out in commemoration of her 80th birthday. No less than 82 years old, which is no small. <laughs> Many years back, a friend of mine calls books like this wrist breakers. They're the sort of things that you're not supposed to, to, to read lying on your back in bed without in danger of breaking your nose. Um, <laughs> this is a collection of, of uh, legends from England, from all over the country, which Jacqueline put together along with Jen Jennifer Westwood. Jennifer Westwood, yeah. yes. And uh, she says this, there should really have been three wrist breakers of this, of this size that should have come out to cover almost the whole thing. But then we start moving on to this, um, which is the folklore of Discworld, which um, Jacqueline and Terry Pratchett write yes. together. Now, how come folklore and Discworld? Of course, fa the fantasy, fantasy as a genre, um, what makes it interesting, in a sense, different to science fiction, is that it's set in the past. It reaches out and connects to stories that we know from heroic literature, from myths and things of this kind. Comedy, on the other hand, tends to relate not so much to kings, but to average people, to tramps, to little people, like the rest of us around this room here. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the mythology of the little people is the folklore, the stuff that's been living mm -hmm. and being passed on for centuries in this form. Now, when Terry Pratchett uh, is considering developing the idea of, of uh, Discworld, which you all know about, um, there's a couple of books called The Science of Discworld that have come out, right? I think it's now three it's signs three. of this world, and there's talk of a fourth one. Yes. So this is all, this is out there. We have the art of this world, and then comes the question of the folklore of this world. And since this is a Pratchett, as you know, is deeply rooted in England, then who else can he work with? And the question of the, the folklore of this world, but. Jacqueline here who knows yeah. really everything. <laughs> so I think we'll, we'll start off with um, by asking you, can you say something about where the two of you meet and how this, this, this collaboration comes about? Yes, I will gladly tell the tale. Uh, Terry tells it also, and he tells it with embellishments. This, and this is the Pratchett, the Pratchett Terry, not the Oh, yes. <laughs> I, 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 tell it, I, I tell it too. This is going to be awfully complicated, the two Terrys. Uh, yes, well, my encounter with Terry Pratchett uh, was in 1997, I think, yes, 97. Uh, he was down in my hometown doing a book signing in a bookshop, so very much like this. And uh, I'd been reading him uh, oh, for several years. I, my first book that I read was Weird Sisters, and by the time I'm talking about He'd done Hogfather, and I think the very newest one was Jingo. Uh, and I thought, I, I, yes, I, at first I didn't know that he was going to be in my town at all. A friend phoned me and said, do you know Pratchett is going to be in Worthing doing a book sign? I said, no, I didn't know. She said, I can't be there. If I lend you a book of mine, could you get him to sign it for me, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, yes, splendid. And you know, 
luck. I, I might have been busy that afternoon, but no, I happened to be able to be free. And it said book signing at five o'clock. And I thought, right, book signing at five o'clock, oh, if I get down there by quarter past four, that by quarter past four, the queue was out of the bookshop, round the road, round the corner, practically into the sea. And, <laughs> and the queue took a very long time to get moving. Uh, it was well over an hour before I eventually found myself inside the shop and face to face with Terry Pratchett in his hat. <laughs> So I, I'd got my friend's book to be signed, and I'd brought one of my own to be signed. And rather cheekily, I thought, well, OK, I know he's interested in folklore because it's all over his books, but I d he probably doesn't know much about Scandinavian folklore. So I took along uh, one of my translations of Scandinavian legends, and I presented them. Ah, oh, you are a folklorist. Good. Tell me everything you know about magpies. <laughs> <laughs> Huge cue behind, you see. <laughs> the point, he, he was beginning to collect material for Tarpe Jugulum, uh, the one about the vampires, and he was going to put magpies into it. So I told him as much as I could manage then and there. Uh, I told him that I knew 19 different magpie rhymes. I'm absolutely certain that I do not know 19 <laughs> rhymes, and I never said that I knew them. Anyway, that's how he tells it. Uh, I said, well, here you are, uh, what I can do off the top of my head, but I've got, I know there are more stuff in books that are in my shelves at home. I'll go and take some photocopies and send you photocopies of the stuff, care of your publishers. Uh, observe how tactful I am, care of publishers. You do not send things direct to busy authors. Uh, but this particular busy author said, blow the publishers, here's a post office box number. <laughs> so that was the start. It continued the following year because when I told the Folklore Society in London, of which I was secretary at the time, that I'd met him, they said, ask him to come and lecture to us. And a bit sort of, he never will, he's too busy, but he did. He came, he gave a lecture. And from then on, occasionally, he used to phone me up. Not very often, but you know, it might happen two or three times a year, if that. It might be that he'd remembered part of a rhyme but didn't know how it finished, or he wanted to know what was a reliable book about such and such. And this went on over the years uh, for, I suppose, oh Lord, uh, 10, 12, 10 years maybe. And then one day the phone went. And he said, look, you know, uh, I've got these science friends who do science of this world. I'm wondering whether it would be a good idea, says he, to do a book on the folklore of this world. It needs explaining, because he kept on getting letters from fans asking questions, which made him realize that things which he took for granted that everybody knew, uh, people didn't know, either because they weren't English or because they were young. Uh, <laughs> things are getting forgotten. So I said, yes, that would be splendid. There'd be a lot to say about. And the voice on the phone said, OK, you and I will do it together. <laughs> Swoon. <laughs> and that is how this was inspired. And it came out in the year 2008. And it's got Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og and two magpies on, <laughs> on the cover. And, uh, and the, the, the process of working that book, for example, how, how, how did you go about it? Ah, well, uh, it was all either email or phone calls. We never seemed to manage to organize uh, a, a time to actually meet. Uh, that was because he's always dashing about. Uh, particularly in those days, he used to do a lot of signing tours and so on. So, um, the first, it, it was little sections, and the first section 
that I chose to do was about vampires. I happen to be interested in vampires, uh, Dracula and all that I, I like. So I decided, okay, I will go through the books uh, and pick out everything that he says about vampires and write a few pages about the vampires of Discworld and how they compare with the vampires of Earth. I did that, I sent it to him, the phone went. What you say is true, but you sound so academic. <laughs> <laughs> you are lighten up for heaven's sake. <laughs> so a second version was written lighter and from then I'd got the tone right. Uh, and well, it, it went on in little segments. Each segment would be sent to him. Uh, they segments by no means in the order in which they appear in the book. It was just sort of as the mood took us. And sometimes there would be questions. Uh, I would write something, but I would put in italics, uh, is this accurate? Have I understood what you meant? Or I would say, look, uh, the, this book is going to be read by young people and children. Have I made myself plain? Once or twice, uh, can I say this in a book that might be read by young people and children? <laughs> there was a notable example of that. Uh, in the chapter on heroes, there's a section about heroes who kill dragons. And I talk about various dragon killing uh, le legends in various parts of Britain. And I quote from a poem, a ver poem is too big a word, so, uh, some popular verses about a particular hero who was killed by a particular a particular dragon who was killed by a particular hero who was wearing spiky armour and this dragon had only one vulnerable spot on his entire body <laughs> and uh, it was... Well, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and the verses end up uh, that the dragon uh, fell on his knees and groaned and groaned, kicked shat and died. <laughs> Note from Jacqueline to Terry. Can I have this or shall we uh, not quote this particular verse? <laughs> I wait. Back comes my uh, emailed copy. It has acquired a footnote. The footnote is to the line groaned, kicked, shat and died. It is the little details that charm. <laughs> so yeah, that, 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 was the way, that was the way this was worked. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we move into um, some of the particular areas of that book and, and, and the types of, of folklore, of course, comedy um, is comedy because it can play off. It works in interaction with people reading it, so it plays off things that people know, which is quite. In the case of Terry Pratchett, quite amazing when you have 50 languages um, it's been translated. I believe so, languages. yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, it, it, every time I look the statistics up, it has grown, but I think it's now 50-odd languages that the books have been translated into. Yeah. So I think let's start up with death, I think, as a character. You, do you like death? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can we say about the background of the death figure and what's that playing off? Well, visually, it's a kind of summary of all the elements by which death has been represented in European art history. And going behind that, the way death is described uh, in uh, the book of Revelations, the last section of the Bible, uh, he also draws on medieval traditions of the dance of death, uh, I don't know if this is well known in Scandinavia. Do you have? No, directly not. Oh, right. Uh, in France and Germany, and at one time in England before the Reformation, uh, when there was a lot of pictorial art in churches, murals, uh, stained glass windows and all that, one of the themes was of death 
uh, presented very much as Terry would present him, a skeleton with a cloak and a hood and a scythe, coming and seizing people. Uh, he will take a fair lady by the hand and drag her away and dance with her, or he'll summon a bishop or knight, uh, and as picture after picture of death summoning people and then dancing with them and dragging them away into the afterlife. Have you seen Bergman, um, what's it? Bergman film, um, with, with, with the chess game. Yes. Seventh Seal. Seventh Seal. Remember the last but one shot in that? Death on a skyline, li linking hands with a whole line of figures that he's leading away into the afterlife, black silhouetted figures on the skyline. Uh, all this is, or should be, in our minds when in Reaper Man, um, Miss Flint, Flint, Flintwich, no, uh, the, the, the lady who has the farm where Death has been working, uh, <laughs> says, um, do you dance? And he says, famed for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then they... They join this barn dance, uh, and suddenly uh, a clickety clickety sound is heard, and someone says, uh, Who's playing the castanets? <laughs> I don't need castanets. <laughs> <laughs> so the dancing death is firmly rooted in folk tradition and uh, cultural tradition uh, of the European Middle Ages. But he's, but he's developed over time too, hasn't he? Um, uh, well, Terry's <laughs> death has become... Well, he's such a kind figure, one can't help liking him. Uh, actually, Terry gets letters from people who are dying who say, I hope death will be like you said he is. <laughs> uh, it does very much speak to us. Uh, and of course, it lends itself beautifully to illustrations. Uh, I, I am a particular admirer of Paul Kidby's uh, illustrations rather than Josh Kirby's, but I know that's a matter that divides. Uh, so, yes, is that. Well, how do you think definitely. of him developing? Uh, no, it's, uh, um, his surroundings of the place he lives in, for example, this has been developed. Ah, yes, of course, Death's Domain. Yes, mm -hmm. I was forgetting that. He's got this uh, black, black house with a huge clock with a pendulum which Edgar Allan Poe would have envied. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some of them got that. <laughs> uh, and he grows black flowers in the garden. There's just one area where he allows himself a golden cornfield to remind himself of the time when he was on earth in Reaper Man. And of course he has his pals, Death of Rats, uh, and Quoth the Raven. Uh, I presume we do not have to explain why the raven is called Quoth? <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> And de Death of Rats, well, uh, any, any folklore background? <laughs> no. I, 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 uh, actually, what it is, it's the name of a... a, a it, that's a name that came off a tin of poison. When I was a child, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> I swear to goodness that in my childhood there were tins of... Actually, it was arsenic. Uh, and uh, you, you, th this little tin of green powder had got on it uh, death of rats as the trademark and it was a rat poison which you could buy. Uh, uh, my father had a market garden and that's why he was entitled to buy a little tin of death of rats. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, and uh, death and cats. Well, a particular relationship now. Um, yes, he likes cats. He likes cats very much, and they've got nine lives. So I suppose that gives him eight chances to say hello before. He <laughs> 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 uh, Terry loves cats himself. Um, I could go on at considerable length about Terry's cats. What I've heard please about do, them. Please do. 
Please do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am told that there was once a real Gribo. Uh, this was before my time. It's quite a long time since Gribo has gone to cat heaven, but apparently he did exist. And in more recent times, there was a group a gro five cats who were well established. I'm afraid I can only remember the name of the boss cat who, who was and is called Genghis Khan. <laughs> now, all that, those five cats were more or less the same age. And towards the end of last year, uh, one of the generation of cats died and another was very ill and evidently you know, wouldn't last much longer. So there was getting to be a fear that the Pratchett household might soon be diminished as regards cats. So Lynn, his wife, gave him for his birthday this year uh, two new, very young ragdoll cats. That's a very <laughs> floppy, uh, soft, gentle type of cat. And he has since also bought two British blues. So there are two pairs of young cats and still three of the former generation <laughs> left. So at the moment, Terry has seven cats. <laughs> if we would move on to, to, to other folklore figures, we, the, the wee free men, do you like them? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the, for, for those, I keep on seeing Billy Connolly myself whenever I hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Say more about their, their background, what's being played off with these figures. Ah, uh, start with the name, perhaps. Uh, the nickname of the Scottish Presbyterians, a very, very strict and solemn form of Protestant Christian. Uh, their church is called the We Free Church. <laughs> uh, the historical reason for that was that they were always a minority group and they were free from the interference of bishops. So the first thing that we free men uh, sort of conjures to my mind is the incongruity uh, with the we free Presbyterian Scots <laughs> Church. They are also called Pictses, by no means Pixies, but Pictses. Uh, you, a Pixie is a rather domesticated type of little elf found in southern England. A Pict, on the other hand, was a savage warrior race in Celtic Scotland in the Iron Age. They were called Picts by the Romans because they painted their bodies blue, uh, which of course is what the wee free men all... Uh, uh, oh, and they're also called the Knack McFeagles. And I think, uh, well, I say in the book, and he didn't contradict me, that Fiegel must be a corruption of Fingal, uh, another great heroic figure uh, from both uh, Celt from Celtic legend in general. In Scotland, you get places called Fingal's Cave, a great <coughs> melodramatic cave on the West Coast. So I, I think. The Nech McFiegel, sons of Fiegel, uh, must be sons of Fingal. Uh, anyway, definitely warriors. Their language is based, uh, he tells me, on Glasgow working class slang. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which, bring, which brings us back to Billy Connolly again. This yes. is and, <laughs> and of course, the sheep liniment, which is whiskey. <laughs> And the thing of carrying cows off, which they do occasionally, is cows that are snakes I think they're sort of still, and yet you see them being carried across fields. This is a common... <laughs> Backwards, yeah. Yes, I don't know whether that is common to uh, Picts, or it's certainly not to the Wee Free Church. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Ch church can have amazing effects on <laughs> And in, and in a sense, I suppose, also, um, with, with these figures, the wee free man is, uh, he refers back to both folklore that we know, but also the modern folklore in terms of movies and films. There's, there's Mel Gibson floating around here somewhere. <laughs> and and, and, the, and the, the, the Scottish army and its demands for freedom as uh, William Wallace and stuff. 
I suppose so. <laughs> I am not sufficiently up in cinema to be able to comment on that, but yes, this, this, this would be absolutely characteristic because he knows a lot about cinema and also about pop music, all sorts of areas uh, of information and experience. Uh, he minxes old, old folklore with absolutely present day pop culture, and that's part of what makes it all so funny. Exactly. And which brings us to vampires. And our, our friend Otto, who whenever he sets up, sets up a flash thing, just fits into a cloud of dust. <laughs> oh. Precious vampires. Well, what about them? Yeah, dear me. <laughs> um, well, there are several different ones, aren't there? There's, uh, uh, there's the Count de Magpier. Uh, which is a kind of play on vampire and the idea of Count Dracula and uh, and isn't the ancestor of that family called Old Red Eyes which kind of alludes to Frank Sinatra Old Blue Eyes <laughs> <laughs> and the Count de Magpier is trying to bring up his family to be very modern uh, and to, um, uh, to be perfectly able to drink wine, but to refrain from blood. Uh, and it isn't working terribly well. Though if, I think if I remember rightly that one of the girls is rebelling and insisting on wearing pretty lacy white dresses. <laughs> to, uh, and the son is called Vlad. Uh, and here we move into Dracula and Vlad the Impaler uh, and the whole idea that Vlad is a suitable name for a vampire. Uh, then on the other hand, in another book, can't for the moment remember which, we have the middle class couple who have, the husband has inherited the title from uh, an actual vampire <laughs> uncle, and consequently now he's trying to make crypts and vaults uh, <laughs> under his semi-detached house. <laughs> <laughs> and we have the whole gang uh, of the vampires who have abjured blood and are reformed characters. Uh, I think that is uh, an institution which Lady Margolotta of the Überwald founded. Oh, and Überwald. Uh, I had to be told this, I hadn't spotted it myself, Terry told me. Transylvania means beyond the forest. Transylvania. Überwald, again, German, beyond the forest. So <laughs> Überwald is Transylvania. Uh, and some of the vampires there have taken the oath, uh, the pledge of never drinking blood anymore. They go to meetings closely modelled on those of Alcoholic Anonymous, <laughs> where they stand around drinking cups of cocoa and singing encouraging songs to one another and avoiding the bee bird. <laughs> and every vampire who gives up his bloodlust wears a little twist of black ribbon. Um, I think at the time when this was being written, we were probably going through a phase of an awful lot of twists of ribbon to demonstrate <laughs> political or medical allegiance. Uh, we still have the red ribbon for supporters uh, of AIDS, uh, charities and AIDS rights and so on. Uh, all this goes back to the Victorian period when people joining anti-alcoholic societies called themselves the Blue Ribboners and wore a little blue ribbon in their lapels or, or pinned to their blouse as a female. So Terry's black ribbon vampires uh, call on that idea. Curiously enough, they, uh, anyone who gives up drinking blood gets inevitably some kind of other obsession instead. And Otto, who was mentioned just now, his obsession has become photography. But of course, the trouble is that whenever he's photographing in the dark, he used salamanders for flashlight, and the intense flashlight causes him to collapse in a little pile of dust, <laughs> which is what happens to Dracula in some of the Hammer Horror films, isn't it? Uh, but he can be revived, but both Dra Dracula can be revived by a few dribbles of human blood. Otto. Uh, uh, 
uh, uh, take a piece of whole beef and squeeze it, uh, that, that'll do fine. <laughs> Part of the art is certainly also, as we've talked about before, this blend of, of earlier folklore and the world, which is a sort of medieval, almost Victorian, blend of medieval and Victorian world. Can mm -hmm. you say that? Uh, uh, oh, yes, with a little bit of Elizabethan. And let <laughs> us not forget the Italian uh, princely cities. Vetinari is related to the Medici families, Med, Vet. Medical, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Medici's veterinary, yeah, yeah, yeah. And guilds, that's medieval. Right. And you get gradually you get cameras coming in of some form or another, you get the, 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 the shutters system, what, what, no, what, the clacks. Clacks, yes. Um, so, so there is technology arriving, but nobody's got mobile phones or anything of this kind out there. But in a sense, this also, you see it with the police force, of course, and, and the equality system of, the, uh, of Vimes police force. And in a sense, also, it, it, it affects the way you look at things. And certainly as a university worker, I cannot go to any university meeting without seeing pointy hats. <laughs> <laughs> does mass meetings up quite a lot. When I'm a little bit, and then you suddenly see a little pointy hat on one side and, and the bursar and the frog pills. And, and, and. But, but, but even the unseen university has, has its roots, doesn't it, in, in folklore? Uh, yes. Uh, of course, its main route is not folklore at all, but the actual old-fashioned Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, but yes, it does have various rituals, uh, some of which are surprisingly accurate. Uh, you've unseen academicals. How many of you have read it? <laughs> yeah, 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 everyone. OK, you remember how very near the beginning, there's this sudden clatter of heavy stamping feet uh, and a bevy of uh, bowler-hatted bledlows, are they not called, uh, uh, carrying the professors on their shoulders, are uh, charging through the university yelling, oh ho, the megapode, yo ho, the megapode, uh, chasing poor old Rinswind who's dressed up as a duck. <laughs> <coughs> Do you know that this is true? <laughs> <laughs> it is. This is an actual ceremony performed at All Souls College, Oxford. The hunting of the mallard. It's done once every hundred years. <laughs> it was done in 2001, so I'm sorry to say, unless you are exceptionally long-lived, you, you, you are unlikely to see it in 2101. But yes, once every hundred years, uh, an imaginary duck, a mallard, is hunted uh, and they go all through the college, starting on the ground floor. Uh, uh, oh, uh, and they've had a huge meal first, I should mention. That. <laughs> yes, that's very patchety. They, they sit down to an enormous banquet and then, thoroughly drunk, I presume, they, they, they stagger through the college and they end up going up through trap doors onto the roof. And as they go, they sing a song uh, about uh, that other people... Uh, may feast on swan or beef or whatever, but the men of all souls want their mallard. And there is a, and the chorus of the song is, uh, it, uh, oh, for the blood of King Edward, oh, ho, the blood of King Edward, it was a swapping, swapping mallard. <laughs> and I said to Terry, over the phone, uh, why have you not put uh, any song in Unseen Academicals. And he said, I didn't know there was a song. <laughs> so I, I said, there is, and you'll find the words on Wikipedia. And he said, oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> and I read him, or, or recited to him, oh, the blood of King Edward. It was a swapping, swapping mallard. And he said first, what does swapping mean? And I said, what do you think it means? And he said, ah. <laughs> and yes, one of the verses of the song does make it perfectly clear that, that uh, swapping... Well, he's a very large and active mallard. <laughs> and then the next question 
was which King Edward? What have kings got to do with it anyway, and which King Edward was it? And I said, nobody knows. There were three English, no, four English kings called Edward in the course of the Middle Ages. So I said, nobody knows. And then I said, right, if nobody knows, then that's proper folklore. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, for, for, for the Icelanders too, they had the Black School, of course, uh, the, 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 the stories of the Black School. And the oh, yes, the Black School. We very nearly forgot, uh, I, I blush to say, that the book was complete. It had been sent to the printers, the script had been sent to the printers. Uh, it was almost at proof stage. And in the middle of the night, I woke up, and, oh my God, neither of us has remembered to mention the black school. Now, that is very important, because there are idiots, complete nincompoops, <laughs> imbeciles, uh, who think that Pratchett pinched the idea of the unseen university from Harry Potter. <laughs> said idiots and nincompoops had ever bothered to look at publications dates, they would know that Unseen University is mentioned right from some of the very earliest Discworld books before Potter was born or short of. But anyway, I thought, oh, I've got to do something about this, We because I know there are people out there who think that Pratchett steals from Rowling. Uh, so I told Terry of this dreadful situation, and I promptly emailed the, um, the publishers and said, look, can I possibly add a paragraph or two about the tradition of the black school? I think if we sort of squeezed it in on such and such page, I mean, I don't want to ask you to repaginate. Uh, it would have been appropriate to put it in on page 90, and there's still quite a lot of pages to go. And uh, the dear lady at Trent was, oh, it doesn't matter, write as much as you like, we can easily repaginate. If you have had any dealings with publishers, you will know that this is a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend uh, who is liable cynically to sing the first line of a hymn uh, and the way he sings it is, at the name of Pratchett, every knee shall bow. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting on to songs after that. Um, elves, he doesn't like elves. Icelanders have elves, different sorts of elves. He doesn't like elves. No, he very definitely doesn't like elves. He said in print somewhere or other that it's because uh, they're tall and good looking and have lots of hair. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, uh, the, the, the folk tradition of elves is extremely ambiguous. Uh, in England, it goes back to the Anglo Saxon period, and we know that in the Anglo Saxon period, on the one hand, people were giving their sons names like Alfred, which means wisdom of elf, uh, or Elfnoth, uh, the strength of an elf. Uh, so, you know, you don't go naming your sons names with elf in it unless elves are good things. On the other hand, we also know that at the same period, elves were blamed for various diseases. And the reason we know that is because there are medical manuscripts containing charms and recipes to be used against elf shot. And this ambiguity, this double-sidedness, continues right down through the tradition, and it affects modern literature. Tolkien took everything that was good and noble and artistic and aristocratic about elves, and on the other hand, Sylvia Townsend Warner, a much less well-known writer, but uh, a good one, and Susanna Clarke in the fairly recent, very large fantasy book, uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, they both present elves as very sinister. So Terry is not alone in emphasizing <coughs> cruelty, 
and sinisterness. He has picked one side of the tradition and Tolkien took the other side. <coughs> and where, 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 where do orangutan librarians come from? <laughs> <laughs> Only the fact that he loves orangutans. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing like that in folklore anywhere. <laughs> And luggage with little legs. <laughs> uh, luggage with little legs. He has two versions of what inspired that. One is the first time he ever saw somebody dragging a suitcase on wheels, because he, you know, he's old enough to remember the first suitcase on wheels that he ever <laughs> saw. So that's one inspiration. And the other is something to do with some kind of online game that he used to play years ago, where people had chests into which they put weapons or treasures or things. Uh, and in this game, your treasure chest would follow you, uh, and you'd find it when you need it. So I, I, he's given two versions of the luggage. And if we move on from songs which I've been meaning to talk about for a while, we were talking about in the car before, witches, and uh, we, we can ask more about witches afterwards, the hedgehog song. <laughs> yes. Which, which I've been dying to know about for years, and I was given a rendition of the original hedgehog song. I don't know the tune, no. and I have not bought... You know what the hedgehog song is, don't you? No, and this is N Nanny Ogg's song that she has to be sort of bandaged and held back from singing. <laughs> yes, one occasionally hears it in the distance, but never, ever, ever does one hear it in full, or even any particular words of it. Well, there is an English song sung by wild young men playing rugby and by medical students uh, and similar ill-mannered oiks. <laughs> uh, it's got several verses. The first line, in case you ever want to look it up on the internet, is something like, the sexual habits of camels are something exceedingly odd. <laughs> I th that's the first line in the version that is in a book of English bawdy songs that I have at home. And each verse ends with this couplet. Protracted and painful researchers by Darwin and Huxley and Ball, three great scientists, uh, have conclusively proved that a hedgehog can never be buggered at all. <laughs> <laughs> and this goes on for several verses together with a lot of information about how you should approach this or that animal, uh, swans feature, I remember, and uh, camels and giraffes even, if you're exceedingly tall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, until you get to the last verse, which says, but uh, the, clever, the clever young students at Yale have proved you can bugger a hedgehog if you first shave the spines off its tail. <laughs> I told Jacqueline this would change our whole image of her. But I, I, I did read an article somewhere about the songs you were singing at university, which also changed my image. Uh, yeah, uh, this was not one of them. Uh, I went to an all-women's college, and though we sang songs which we thought were very daring, they were nowhere they <laughs> but if we go away from, from, from folk, folkloristic beings and move on to traditions, there's a lot of traditions that are referred to, of course, as well. Like uh, the, the, the unseen academicals, for example, in the football. Yes. Uh, what is said in unseen academicals about football being a wild game played up and down the streets of the towns and everybody sort of boarding up their windows uh, and that is really a free fight in which hardly anybody ever sees the ball. Uh, th th this was true. This was how football was played in England uh, and Scotland oh, well on into the uh, 18th century, I think. And there are still places where you can see it done. There aren't very many, but one of them is on the Orkneys. Uh, go to Kirkwall in the uh, Orkneys on New Year's Day. Uh, they say, do it 
twice, I think, you'll have to check this, you know, before you book your plane, but um, <laughs> I think it's on Boxing Day and New Year's Day, and the goals are a couple of miles apart, and uh, everybody fights their way from one goal to another, and it's supposed to have started uh, by kicking the head of a defeated Oh dear, I forget whether it was a defeated Viking or a defi defeated Irishman. I forget what to say. Uh, anyway, a head was being kicked, they say. Listen quietly, you can hear the luggage going by outside. <laughs> oh, yes! A procession of luggage. I believe they're still playing it in Derbyshire somewhere. On, yeah. on, on show, show Tuesday. Yes, yes, the Derbyshire is one of, uh, I can't remember the name of the place, but yes, you look up street football, uh, or, or indeed, I think, uh, not in the hardback, but in the paperback version, uh, where there's an appendix on folklore in Unseen Academicals. Uh, I see someone summing through the... Yes. Notes on the folklore of unseen academicals, uh, the mallard, uh, Atherstone in Warwickshire for several hours on Shrove Tuesday in front of large crowds. Um, I don't mention the, but I, I know there are several places. Um, and related games like the bottle kicking contest on Easter Monday at Hallerton in Leicestershire, and so on and so forth. Uh, ah, yes, here, Kirkwall in the Orkneys, twice a year on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. Uh, and it's someone called Earl Sigurd who fought and, and killed the Scottish Earl Mel Brichter. I probably am not pronouncing him right. So it's your Scandinavian Earl de killing a Highland Scottish Celtic Earl whose head was then kicked through the streets of <laughs> And Hogwatch, for example, just changed our whole image of Christmas. Yes. Uh, oh dear. There's so that. much to say about Hogwatch. Uh, well. Start with the hog. What? <laughs> Start with the hog. Start with the hog. Uh, well, uh, Terry likes pork. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he loves sausages, and I may say his wife discourages both tastes, but he, he loves pork and sausages. So for him, the idea that the Christmas feast will, would consist of pork products is definitely a good thing. He also is aware uh, of the ferocity of old traditions, and he thinks Father Christmas has become much too softened. And of course, he has this wonderful, wonderful scene in the shop, in the big expensive toy shop, with the lovely glittery hog father <laughs> and grotto, and pretty little pink packy mashy cribs and then the real fa hog father, or to be accurate, death pretending to be the real hog, <laughs> comes crashing through the ceiling, and one of the hogs misbehaves, uh, and death starts giving the children the gifts they actually want. <laughs> and he has quite misunderstood the situation. He thinks his job is to give the gift. And poor shopkeeper, desolated. <laughs> oh, it, it is wonderful. Uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and things like in the Tiffany books with the, with the long with the dance, uh, the long dance that takes place there. Um, is there anything about that? The dance of winter. So, so, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I'm being mean. Here. It's rather difficult to know quite what to say. It's a symbol of the turning of the seasons. Um, it's related to the idea that one holds dances. Uh, it's also related to the myth of Persephone, the summer goddess who disappears underground in winter. Uh, the winter god, uh, the, the ice man, the winter smith. 
I'm not absolutely sure. I, I, in fact, I don't know how much of what went into Wintersmith. Uh, I, I know it's very powerful, but uh, I can't entirely melt it down into bits of folklore. Mm. There's a, so certainly, you've been telling me as well that if, if we go to Terry Pratchett himself, he's, he's, a, he's a person who likes traditions. He's very traditional himself. Oh, yes. Uh, he's curious. He's an extraordinary mixture. He, he, he's passionately devoted to traditions, but on the other hand, he's well up in science. Uh, I am sure that if I were a scientist, I would be able to have uh, intelligent conversations about quantum and alternative <laughs> universes and all sorts of things. There are people who talk with him about that kind of thing and astronomy. And he's also very, very interested in actual doing of things. Um, he's very practical. He has, in the, in the past, I know from various conversations, that he has kept bees, like Granny Weatherwax does. He has kept sheep and goats. Uh, in fact, there are sheep. Uh, he doesn't own them himself, but the land next to his estate it belongs to a farmer who does have sheep. Terry himself keeps chickens and is very fond of his chickens. And I mean fond of them as individuals. I don't mean that he eats them. He, 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 eats, he collects the eggs, but he doesn't eat the chickens themselves. And you will find that chickens do turn up in his books fairly often. There, there's chickens on the barge uh, going down the river in uh, snuff. Uh, there are chickens squawking underground in thud. Uh, look out for chickens. There are quite a few of them. Uh, what else does he know how to do? He makes cheese. He can cook. Uh, a friend of mine who was at school with Terry has childhood stories uh, which would imply that he was more or less okay at woodwork, whereas the friend who was telling the story wasn't. Um, and then, of course... Yeah, the, the sword, because he's now Sir Terry, and there's a long story here. Oh, God, I need a glass of water before <laughs> embarking on this one. Terry was knighted for services to literature in 2009, I think. And as uh, uh, he went off to Buckingham Palace, he was knighted by the Queen. Uh, his comment afterwards was that knowing something about swords himself, he realised what a very strong wrist the Queen must have. <laughs> uh, 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 anyway, that was uh, his one recorded comment. Uh, he knew that a knight should have various things. A knight should have a large white horse. His wife said, no. <laughs> Cats, yes. Chickens, yes. Sheep coming through the hedge from next door, yes, if you must. Owls, by all means, rescue them and rear them. But no large horse. <laughs> So he then said, well, OK, he, he would have a sword. And wife permitted the idea of a sword. <laughs> I, at this point, would have gone to an antique shop and bought an antique short sword. No, 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 he's got to make it. And he, he not only has to make the sword itself, but he's got to make everything that leads up to the making of the sword. So. The target for the daily healthy walks on the Wiltshire Downs becomes a particular hillside where there are outcrops of iron ore. So that's his daily target for his walk. Takes a basket, takes a little hammer, and is chipping off bits of iron ore and bringing them home. Then he uh, notices that he's got a variety of old bricks from some wall that has tumbled down or something. So he and his wonderful assistant, Rob, build a, a kiln out of these bricks. For fuel, 
you take the dung of the next door sheep <laughs> and you dry it off and sheep dung is a very efficient fuel and you strike fire not with a cigarette lighter, not with matches, but with a stick thing that you do that for hours. And he melts down all this iron ore. But at some stage in the procedure, Colin Smythe, who is his literary agent and a good friend of his, Colin said, look, Terry, a magical sword, it needs not only iron from the earth, it needs iron from the sky. So Colin went on to the internet and he found that there was someone who was selling on eBay fragments of an iron meteor. Uh, some, some meteors are stone and some are iron based. And there was this iron based meteor that had fallen in Russia in 1947 and broken into many fragments. And I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, uh, Colin bought up the, the fragments of this meteor. Most of them were given to Terry. A few were handed out to other people, and I've got one which I turned into a pendant. This is a fragment of an iron meteor, and if Terry is ever in mortal danger, this will glow. <laughs> point, of course, uh, even his skills give out. He's not big enough, strong enough, let alone experienced enough to actually be a blacksmith and make a sword. So the melted down iron from the earth and iron from the sky was handed over to a professional swordsmith who makes swords for reenactment societies. I'm sure you must have reenactment societies in Iceland. No. You don't have people yeah, who... Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, not very many. So. Uh, there are quite a few in England, and several of them are concentrate on the Anglo-Saxon period, and Terry went to a swordsmith who makes Anglo-Saxon swords and has a, a long, heavy Anglo-Saxon sword. He can't take it about to meetings because it's against the law in England to carry <laughs> an offensive weapon in public, and I assure you that sword would be extremely offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sit down. I am going to sit down. Mm. Actually, while we're talking about, about this glowing, there are other connections between you and Terry, right, in terms of something he's going to be buried with at some point, which goes back to, but goes back to a Discworld convention and, and, and a certain role that you acted there. Courtesan's Guild. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Terry. <laughs> this, this is with these other things. Uh, we won't tell the story. <laughs> this, 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 these guises that Jack Jacqueline goes to to the, to the Dis Discworld convention. This year you went as what? what was uh, this year I went as Bastet the cat-headed Egyptian goddess of things left half-eaten under the bed. <laughs> I had a sort of Egyptian robe, a sort of Egyptian headdress, and a cat mask. And he didn't recognize me till I laughed. <laughs> As for what this wicked man was referring to, the first convention I went to, uh, they allotted me uh, to the Seamstresses Guild. <laughs> and so I, w I dressed as, well, a retired but still saucy. Um, <laughs> and I must have been to be shocked when I heard about this first. <laughs> <laughs> I had a scarlet feather boa, I had a fan, I had a fluffy skirt, uh, and I had a red garter. <laughs> <laughs> and on the last day of the convention, I gave my garter to Terry. <laughs> and I, he swears he has still got it, and occasionally he says he'll be buried with it. But this <laughs>
I mean, talk about teeth, too. The, the other story you gave me today. Um, teeth? Teeth and fillings and things. Oh! <laughs> this has nothing to do with me, this is just Terry. Yeah. Uh, when he was first diagnosed with this form of Alzheimer's that he's got, which I'm glad to say is moving very, very slowly, thank the gods, uh, he read somewhere or other that the teeth filling, the tooth fillings that we used to have in his generation or mine are aluminium based and therefore unhealthy. So one of the first things he did was go to a dentist and presumably under complete anaesthetic have every single tooth filling removed and have the teeth refilled with a modern type of filling which does not contain aluminium. And he said to his dentist, save those fillings, I'm going to have them melted down and turned into cufflinks. They will be the most expensive pair of cufflinks that I own. <laughs> and the dentist absolutely refused, in tones of shocked horror, said, I cannot possibly allow this. Aluminium is exceedingly poisonous. I will not permit you to wear cufflinks made of aluminium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end up with, with from my side, one, one last question, which brings back to Granny Weatherwax and I Ain't Dead, and her, and her, pro, her problems with, with animals that she's become. Uh, yes, her, her, her borrowing, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, the chief inspiration, I suppose, is shape changing. But uh, he does make it very, very plain that Granny Weatherwax does not actually change shape. She just sends her mind out to enter the minds of other animals. Uh, we have a certain amount of that in folklore, in traditions about witches who travel uh, to the Sabbath, uh, leave, apparently they're still in bed but actually they have gone off to the Sabbath. Um, we have idea, but what we chiefly have in England, in, in Britain and as far as I know in Scandinavia too, is the witch actually changing into the animal and then changing back again. But I, I think his borrowing is a more subtle, subtle and interesting idea. Uh, I like the borrowing witch. And certainly the, the, the consequences for her on ch changing rule, because she takes a while to go back to normal, doesn't it? Oh yes, um, she, I remember her coming back after she's been a swarm of bees uh, and coming to uh, with a strong desire for some sun honey and a chance to sting someone <laughs> and, and, and with a kind of buzz in her voice. <laughs> I'm going to open up now for, for maybe the next quarter of an hour uh, to questions from anybody else in the room. That's not to Three types of oracles, if I can count them correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, what about that? The three kinds of dragons. <coughs> oh, I. The big fierce sort is the traditional sort. The little tame dragon which ladies carry on their shoulders or you put in their muffs in cold weather and so on, <laughs> that's his invention. And the moon dragons, uh, the, 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 the real <coughs> celestial dragon, that's his invention. Uh, but the dragon that lies coiled round the world, uh, which is not it's not on Discworld, it's one of the other universes that Rincewind rapidly glimpses while he's falling through space. He sees a world with a little red worm coiled in the sea all round the edge of it. And you know that. I don't need to. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I want to know what the most disturbing comes there is Horus. And the cheese run. And the cheese run. Uh, rolling cheeses downhill is an authentic English custom. It has to, it has to be English. There's no other nation that would roll. Uh, 
the police have several times tried to ban it. Uh, it takes place uh, in a Gloucestershire village. It used to be done in many villages, often on fair days. It, it was a, a favourite competition uh, for tough young men at fairs. There's only one place that still does it, and every year the police threatened to close it down. So far it has survived, though there was one particular year when it only survived in a concealed sort of way. Uh, the police were going to be on guard at the official time, but the men of the village got up at six in the morning <laughs> and did a little quick race, just so it would never be interrupted. As for Horace, who is so wild and fierce and runs uphill, uh, I have no idea where that comes from. <laughs> yes? Uh, there is a mention, particularly in the whole part, of uh, being able to control someone by controlling their body part by owning them. Where yeah. does this come from? Genuine folklore. Uh, I am surprised that you need to ask. I would have thought it was universal that if you want to put a curse on somebody, the thing to do is to get hold of something that was once I, either closely associated with them or preferably part of them, uh, snip off some hair, collect some nail clippings, uh, put it in a ball of wax, mould the ball of wax into the shape uh, of the person you desire to curse and curse him. Uh, do you really not have that in Iceland? I do with politicians all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? <coughs> yes? Um, there are a lot of weird, like, mythical animals that the salt take duck and I can't remember all of them. Are most of these, like, Things that just pop into Terry's mind, or are they based on previous English things? The soul cake duck sounds very English. The soul cake duck. Um, I think the duck is probably his own. Soul cakes are real. Uh, they were little biscuits that were made as the special food to eat on All Souls Day while praying for the souls of the dead, uh, which was a custom, uh, well it goes back of course to Roman Catholic times, but it still continued into the 19th century, though people had forgotten about praying for the souls of the dead, but they still made little cakes on <laughs> November the 1st and called them soul cakes. Uh, how the duck gets involved, uh, and that I think is Terry being funny. <laughs> yes, in the back. Uh, I'm trying to remember the right word for it, but the, the, the small beings in snuff, uh, the, the, oh, the goblins. The goblins came to us. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What can you say about the goblins? I, f I find it rather difficult to talk about the goblins uh, in snuff because it seems to me that they have rather lost any connection with folk tradition. I cannot think of any supernatural being that is oppressed and enslaved uh, and lacking in self-confidence and totally miserable. <laughs> I, uh, I know many different types of fairy, elf, and indeed goblin, uh, and they're none of them like that. I think what's happened is that Terry is very, very concerned with oppression of minorities. He's got a powerful indignation about all forms of social injustice, and he wanted to write a book that would involve slavery. What, what he's getting at, really, is the American plantations, Negro slavery, and so on. And he just took a traditional name, but invented a few new set of character characteristics. Uh, I know of no goblin or elf who is in any way suffering the way those goblins do. <laughs> uh, that this word itself being uh, carried on the, on the back of four elephants that stand on a big turtle. 
Where does it come from? Uh, India, basically. Um, it is an authentic part uh, of Indian... Uh, I, it's a little confused because there are several different Indian myths and he has blended them. But there is certainly one in which the world is carried on the back of, I think, one elephant, which is standing on a turtle, which is standing on a fish, which is swimming. There's also uh, a, a joke going back uh, oh, several gen generations about uh, an Indian explaining to an Englishman that the world is carried on the back of an elephant, which is carried on the back of a turtle, and the Indian, uh, the Englishman saying snootily, and the turtle, what does that stand on? And the Indian saying, ah, Saab, from then on it is turtles all the way down. <laughs> uh, and that joke, I managed to find an allusion to it in a short story by Somerset Maugham in the 1930s, and uh, Stephen Hawking, the astronomer, uh, uses it as a joke at the beginning uh, of his book on time. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, uh, the idea is quite well known. Uh, and I remember Terry saying in a talk somewhere that on one occasion an Indian family arrived with books to be signed and he said a bit, uh, uh, you know, a bit embarrassed, uh, look, do people mind in India that I took one of your myths? Oh, no, 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 you take, you take all. <laughs> A traditional goblin is a small but powerful craftsman, um, often associated with mining. Um, <coughs> those, of you know, those of you know the Hobbit, of course, that's, then, then Tolkien doesn't use orcs there, he uses goblins, and, and, and he's playing, he's referring yeah, yes. at that time. Are they um, well, I, I actually, I was I, in my mind, I was starting with the helpful goblins, the one that live, live, ones that, that live in lead mines and copper mines, and you hear them tapping, uh, and you know that if you can hear the goblins tapping, that's where the best ore is. But of course, you're quite right, a goblin can also be a mischievous and dangerous type of fairy found in waste, wild waste places, and that's the type that Tolkien is referring to. Golems? Golems. Go golems. Golems. Uh, golems are Jewish. Um, uh, well, by that I mean the concept of the golem is Jewish. Go golem is a Hebrew word meaning uh, a lump of unshaped matter, um, a great formless lump of something. The the Jewish myth or tradition or folk tale is that in times when Jews are very persecuted, a really powerful and holy rabbi will be able, by the power of his holiness and wisdom, to take a lump of clay and mould it into human shape uh, and make a great clay man of it and then breathe into it and bring it to life and put in its hollow head, or in some versions in its mouth, a word which means something like work or guard or serve, uh, various different versions of what the word is, and as long as the golem has that uh, order locked away in his skull, he will be the servant of the Jewish community in that place, and he will guard them against Gentiles who are trying to persecute them and kill them. And when uh, the golem is no longer needed, the, all the rabbi needs to do is take the word out from his head and the clay man will collapse. Uh, there is, the best known story about this is associated with a certain seven, 18th century rabbi in Prague, I'm afraid I've forgotten his name, 
uh, and there is an old, old synagogue in Prague where there is a walled up home where nobody ever goes and it's said that the lump of clay, which is all that is left of the golem, is locked up there and you must be careful not to rouse it. There's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, they always seem to have these bad, rolling eyes in the Russians. Yes, and, and Vimes is most unhappy. If, if, if Vimes has to ride a horse, yes, he's horribly unhappy. Yes, I, I strongly think that that bit about I wanted a white stallion but Lynn wouldn't let me, uh, yeah. <laughs> somebody else, somebody else over there. Morris dancers and their bells. <laughs> oh, ye gods and little fishers. Uh, what do you... Yes, they exist. Yes, there are many, many Morris dancing teams in England now. Yes, it's a traditional dance, probably dating to the Middle Ages. Some people will try to tell you it's prehistoric. Uh, that's too romantic. Uh, we can only track it back to the late Middle Ages. Uh, it's quite well documented in Elizabethan times and in Shakespeare's time. It gradually, uh, like many things, it was suppressed by the Puritans at the time of our Civil War. It nearly died away and was nearly forgotten, but at the end of the 19th century, uh, an important folk law collector called Cecil Sharp uh, saw one of the last groups of Morris men dancing in Oxfordshire, uh, talked with them, noted down the music, noted the steps of the dance, and now there are Morris clubs all over England, and there are two or three different styles of dancing and different types of uh, uniform of costume, but yes, they always have the bells, which is a feature they do share with folk dancers in many parts of Europe. The point being, uh, these are the dancers of the poor. They're not going to have very much in the way of music. They may have a little drum, a fiddle, in more recent times an accordion, but the bells which clank uh, and uh, with the stamping uh, are the main percussion instrument uh, to which controls the dance. Dungeon dimension. Dungeon dimension. <laughs> uh, isn't there, or wasn't there? I don't play. I don't play internet games myself. But wasn't there a famous thing called Dungeons and Dragons? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, explain. Uh, is that where the dungeons? That was my feeling. Certainly, it was a reference to that. To the, the dungeon dimension, the other world, the other side. Oh, I see a head shaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I just want to thank you for your wonderful talk, but I, I just want to point out questions like this that if you don't, you should buy um, Declan's book. <laughs> but you should also, unfortunately, not been updated for about five or six years. But if you look on the internet for the annotated Pratchett pile, yes. you will find a something that was collected on the internet over a period of about 12 or 14 years and it will it stops annotating about six or seven years mm -hmm. ago but partly yes. because his lots reference and lots of dried off. but you will find but use will them both because uh, the annotated Pratchett file has stuff that I don't have uh, particularly of course because it has everything not it just it has the popular culture stuff that yes which I don't popular. have on the in, other in, hand in there you will find out that the evil Selachi and, and Menturi clans of Ankh-Morpork are really the sharks and the jets for those, <laughs> for those who know your musical. But, yeah. but yes, you, it, it sort of, your, your book of course is, is way deeper on the folklore side. Anything that corresponds to that, uh, it's an extraordinary idea. Uh, 
very beautiful, very tragic, very horrible in a way. I don't know where he got it from, I don't know what he's thinking of. Uh, I don't know if I will ever... So, sometimes the publishers ask me to update, uh, for instance, you won't... F the hardback was written before Snuff and Unseen Academicals, uh, before, and even before Thud, but you'll find things about that in the paperback. If, uh, if they ever ask me to add some more, I will try, but I don't think I will ever understand the Angor pots unless Terry himself explains. Well, of course, there is this, this, the, the reference to being stuck to the hand, which takes us back to fairy tales and things, of course, of people in a long line being stuck to each other. Right? Um, oh, yes. Yeah, yes, yes I hadn't thought of that. So, but, but this is just a motive that's being used. Mm. Okay, one, one more, maybe. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, this is probably the last question for me, I hope. Uh, do you have any idea if fairy has got any of his ideas from Iceland before? Uh, I think... Oh, Valkyries, of course. Uh, burial mounds. Uh, the whole heroic thing which uh, Cohen the Barb... I know Cohen the Barbarian is a take-off of Conan the Barbarian, but, but as he gets more serious in Last Hero, uh, Doom of the Gods, um, yes, he, Territ mentions the Doom of the Gods when the ice giants will break loose uh, and come crashing down onto the plains. Uh, I forget what book that's in, one of the early ones. Uh, dragons, well, yes, we've got dragons all over the place, but uh, I, I think, yeah, but anyway, definitely Valkyrie, Noble Deaths, uh, the hero who must be remembered. Do you remember Cohen sitting on a, uh, on a burial mound? Uh, and his friends say to him, come on, it's supper time. Uh, what are you doing sitting out here? He says, I'm remembering. <laughs> remembering what? The bloke who's buried here. <laughs> what? Why? What was his name? I don't know. Well, what did he do? Nobody remembers. But... Well, someone's got to remember the poor bastard. <laughs> I am remembering. <laughs> the Black Morris. Terry's invention. Uh, it has now come true. There are <laughs> more, there are Morris teams that have endeavoured to recreate the Black Morris. Uh, I think it's one of his most powerful and moving images of death. Uh, I, well, naturally, like everybody who loves Terry, I, I find myself thinking of Terry's own death, uh, which will come eventually. And yes, you've got to dance the light, Boris, and the dark, Morris. You've got to be able to dance both, or you won't be able to dance either. Wondering if there was any particular uh, city more, more than others that inspired Ankh-Morpork? Uh, yes, I can more or less answer that because, of course, the map, uh, Ankh-Morpork has been mapped already and there's a new map that is going to come out this year and it is far more detailed than the existing map of Ankh-Morpork and it is of a different period by which time Ankh-Morpork will have grown and oh we've been having fun thinking of street names because there are hundreds more streets on the new map than there were on the first one and everybody connected with Pratchett has been asked for ideas about street names. So now we're all, has my name been chosen? Will I, uh, will I find one of my names on the map? Uh, he said that uh, he did at first have one particular English medieval city in mind, but then later he decided, no, he'd kind of blend them all. So York and Chester, um, up to a point London, uh, uh, probably others, uh, but certainly York and Chester, these medieval cities with walls 
defining the old city, a river, a port, and then the city growing and spreading out beyond the original walls into sprawling suburbs um, and the old marketplaces and all that kind of thing. Uh, uh, York would be a good place to think, but it wasn't the only one that went into the mix. So it certainly has, as you say, the, the, the guilds you see from the various roads. If anybody goes to Istanbul, for example, you go to the Grand Bazaar there, you'll see there how every area of the bazaar is broken up into different groups and guilds of, of people mm. um, in a very different, very similar sort of way. Oh, and I think, yes, I've heard him say in an interview that Prague is an ideal Angkor Park, that when he goes to, some of the filming has been done in Prague, uh, 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 and he feels there's nothing that you need do to Prague, it is Angkor Park. <laughs> now, for, for Luke and my sake, you want to end up on a, on, on, on a character which is a clear blend of both old folklore and modern folklore, that's the Igors and the Igorinas. <laughs> what, what have you got to say about them? Actually, they are cinematic tradition, aren't they, rather than folk tradition. Uh, I mean, you can read Dracula, the original novel, you can read Romanian folklore, uh, you can read Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's novel, you won't find a single Igor anywhere. They came in in horror hammer films, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. I think but perhaps maybe even when I'm thinking of it now, the, the, the Burkers in Scotland, the Bur Burke and Hare who went out collecting dead bodies and things, um, which, which the tramps of Scotland were very frightened of. But anyway. Yes. <laughs> I like the, the Eagles are much nicer. Much I nicer. I think this is a good point, to, rather than stretching us out too long here, I'd like to thank Jacqueline here for spreading her knowledge to, to more of you. Hopefully that this hasn't... Um, weaken the magic of Pratchett, but rather actually extend it and show you how much more there is within these books that you can go on finding by reading uh, reading the books again and again, and especially by having this book somewhere <laughs> close to you. Let's give her a big clap.